Welcome to our first virtual uh, lunch and learn minus the lunch, uh, unless you brought it yourself. Uh, you know, to, uh, we're, we're working with uh, through everything that's going on. I didn't really write anything down, so this is I'm winging it here like normal. Uh, we have uh, one of our members, Ingo Rosenbaum. He's been a member for quite a while. He's been he's mentioned multiple times that he'd like to present and he was set to present over at little italy of course uh we got stuck with uh, everything that's going on right now so he gets to do the inaugural virtual learn because there's no lunch anyway um i don't have anything else uh bruce matt you guys have anything um one thing uh, as people sign in, if you just signed in with your first name, uh, could you send a chat out and just let us know uh, first and last name so we can get you checked off on the attendance roster? Thanks. All right, Ingo. Well, it's all you now. Okay, it's all bad. Okay, so thank you again very much. Uh, for the opportunity to, to give a lunch and learn session. Um, before I start, let me point out two things. Uh, number one, um, as you may know, I'm working for a cybersecurity vendor based in Wiesbaden. Um, right now, I'm a not a rep, a sales rep from Zophos, which I work for. Today, I am a member like you. I'm a CISP like you. And I would like the opportunity to, to learn something uh, which is more or less familiar or uh, already learned a couple of years ago. So using this as a refresher, sometimes for you guys as well. But hopefully that some of you will say, okay, that's brand new, uh, great new information. So that means, sorry, I don't have any big product presentation. I've got some access points and other stuff I would simply like to show you as a general um, device, but nothing more. Uh, sorry again, no marketing, no sales presentation, no pictures, uh, no Forrester Wave, no uh, Gartner quadrants and so on. Uh, I really try to purely concentrate on what's the CISP. I like from the CISP this um, vendor neutral approach. Um, to really teach and learn about technology and uh, methodics in, in this area. So uh, to do this is quite challenging. Therefore, please, please give me, give us, uh, also the board member, um, some kind of feedback. Yes, was good. Yes, a little bit shorter, a little bit longer, whatever. Or really give us some um, constructive, we call it here, uh, critics. That was good, but I would like to see this better or I would like to see more demos, or I would like to see X, Y, Z. So any feedback is really highly, highly, highly appreciated. Please, that's, that's the one we really need from you. The third one, um, why Wi-Fi? Um, I took uh, this little book here, you already know, that's a CBK, and um, it has exactly seven page about a technology we are all using, um, which is around us. Um, everyone has got Wi-Fi in their home, everyone using Wi-Fi at their, at their um, workplace. Um, you have got Wi-Fi in hotspots, airports, in hotel rooms, everywhere. And I think as a, as a security, and I would call us, every one of us, a security manager in, in some sort, in some kind of thing. We are all responsible for security, for network, for IT security. And I think I would like to give a little bit about wireless, some basics, some fundamentals, but also some tips, um, ideas, how to protect your Wi-Fi network. So um, let me start with the agenda, which is a, a rough overview, which gives us a rough overview of what we could do, uh, what, uh, what we will mention today. Uh, we will do a little bit physics and networks. It all comes from the uh, physical um, layer. We will see about a bit history, components, attacks. And if the time is not running completely, 
completely out of the scope, I would like to show you a, um, a web attack, uh, how you can attack this violent uh, um, wired uh, equivalent privacy. It was the first introduction of security to Wi-Fi, how it works, and then to give you some uh, hardening and protection tips. First of all, when we really start with Wi-Fi, we, we have to make sure that the wireless line is nothing else as a radio transmitting and radio receiving technology. Um, this is based more or less on the theory of uh, electromagnetic fields. Um, you know, Heinrich Hertz, Jason Clark Maxwell are the guys who invented or they discovered it. And, and they move it in a, in a, from the mathematical and physical point of view in some usable functions to create a radio sender, radio transmitter, transceiver, and so on. So this theory um, is more or less describing the effect of alternating current flowing through a wire, um, a metal wire, of course. So when a magnetic field is more or less generated around the wire. So these are the very basic. So just if you have just a DC current of a wire, there's no fluctuation, there's no up and running. So you need a sinus wave or something close to a sinus wave to generate an electromagnetic field. So there are a couple of basics here. We talk about wavelengths, uh, which is measured in meter, and they call it lambda, the light speed. Electromagnetic light, uh, electromagnetic speed is the light speed. So light is another form of uh, electromagnetic. We use frequency energy. We have um, um, function Natur constant. And um, there are, of course, some kind of relationship between those physical uh, measurements, like the wavelength is measured in C divided by F, or the energy, so the power you have got into this electromagnetic um, radiation is uh, measured um, in, this, in this formula. So basically, the electromagnetic spectrum we are talking in Wi-Fi later on in more detail refers more or less to the full range of the all possible electromagnetic field energy frequencies. So this energy putting in this alternative current through space, this is called radiation, which we used for Wi-Fi networks. Um, I looked for many diagrams. I know it's all uh, very, very colorful, uh, but it shows you very well how that are related all these different um, uh, physical uh, means. So we have got frequency. We have a, a perfect sinus wave, and now it depends on how, how quick the sinus wave is alternating from zero up to up, down, up to on. And the higher this one is called the frequency. And the higher the frequency, the smaller the wavelength. And uh, we have got a, a huge variety. I mean, the, the, the variety is really, I mean, the bandwidth is very huge. So uh, we have got very long, or let's say long wavelengths with very short frequency on the left-hand side. Uh, on the other hand side, we have this very, very high frequency radiation. And um, if you talk with physics, uh, astronomers, they said, then when, for example, uh, uh, a star is collapsing, yes, it could burst a massive electromagnetic gamma radiation with x zillions of electronic volts. And they said, I can't believe it, but this is what I, what I looked for, this, that um, when we are in a range of 10, 15 light years, it could burn the, the half of the Earth with this power. So electric magnetic radiation could carry a lot of energy, but also, and that's the next one, it could carry a lot of data and information. So the data and information we receive is more or less in the 2.4 up to 5 gigahertz. This is the way we are talking about this. You know, this is the light spectrum. So we have already an antenna um, in bills. It's our eyes. Yes, so we can see electro electromagnetic radiation in this infrared until the ultraviolet um, wavelengths or the frequency. Um, 
which is nothing else than electromagnetic radiation. Unfortunately, we have a little bit like uh, some, um, uh, how can I say, limitations. Otherwise, we could simply talk to each other via wireless LAN or radio frequency. So the radio frequency is below, uh, way below uh, light or the light wavelengths and, and the light uh, frequency. And this is usually where we are talking TV broadcasts, uh, smart meter, FM, AM. You know about this. this is what we call the radio spectrum. And this is where we are looking for and what we are talking later. So when we talk in Germany, you have got in the German language, you have got WLAN. This is more or less very, I know in the, in the English speaking world, Wi-Fi uh, is often or much more used. Uh, please, um, let's give me <laughs> the opportunity, not the opportunity, that, that I have got the, uh, the chance to, to mix this both, um, uh, uh, yes, uh, expressions. Um, but we know that wireless LAN or Wi-Fi means for me the same. So Wi-Fi means you need some modulation and bandwidth we are talking about. The point here is um, if you have got a signal, um, how to carry this signal to you? Yes, when I would like to send Bruce a, a message, I could do this one, zero, one, one, zero, like the Morse, the Morse alphabet, yeah, one, one, zero. And you will receive this. The point is that it works somehow, but it is very, it, it, it has some limitation regarding the bandwidth. I cannot send you that much information, but it's also very, um, there could be a, a lot of interference, a disturbing signal, uh, completely destroys the information. So the idea is let's have a wavelength, a very high wavelength, and then put the data onto this wavelength, of the, onto this wave to provide the data, the information over or onto this wave. Um, so therefore we call this wave carrier wave. Yeah, we have this amplitude modulation, a frequency modulation when, when you radio broadcast 60, 70, 80 years, years ago. So for example, if you want to have music, you can higher amplitudes and it's smaller amplitude and higher amplitudes and the smaller and higher, the receiver can then extract the music or the speech about this. So we use modulation technology <laughs> to carry data or information over a high frequency carrier wavelength. This is exactly what, uh, what we are doing here in Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi is generally operating in the industrial, scientific and medical band. It's 2.4 to 5.8. It has been first of all introduced by the FCC, by the US uh, regulation, later on the EPSI, that's the um, European regulation format. And um, well, we can spend hours all talking about amplitude, frequency, and phase shifting. Um, so meaning how can I put digital data and put this on the wavelengths? Um, Point here is that a sinus wave itself has got para three parameters. One is the amplitude, how powerful the wave can travel. One is the frequency, how much in one second uh, up and downs and up and downs are happening. And the other one is the phase. With phase, we mean you have got a zero and mostly it's measured in degrees. You have then a phase shift. 45 degrees, 90 degrees, 80, and that will carry out some information about, okay, is it a one or a zero? Yes, 90 degrees means one, 80 degrees means zero, and so on, so on. And you can code this, and you often hear this quad uh, amplitude modulation and other kind of, um, um, of technologies, which are used to, put more bandwidth over the carrier wave and to put more bandwidth and um, uh, uh, disturbance uh, protection uh, for this kind of uh, tran transmitting data. Again, this is an entire scientist and I would really just uh, 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 question the surface about this, but it's important that you have uh, known about this because the various standards later on relies on this different um, uh, of, um, frequency or amplitude or phase shift keying technologies. Um, 
three important stuff are the frequency hopping spread spectrum, the direct sequence spread spectrum, FHSS and DSSS. They have been introduced at the first technology. The orthogonal or orthogonal frequency division multiplexing OFDM is the latest hot stuff. It's been used in also 3G, 4G, whatever G technology. So it's a well known or well used engineering um, methodology. To, um, to send out radio frequency or digital information over radio frequency. However, as OFDM is the current standard, and it is not a spread spectrum technology, I found this explanation, uh, multi-carrier frequency domain multiplexing modulation technology. Okay, great. Uh, what the heck does it mean? So, to be honest, um, I'm just a normal engineer. Yes, I had this in university a billion years ago, but uh, when, when I prepared this, I said, what do they mean? And I think it's worthwhile to let's dig a little bit into this. Um, if you look in mathematics, uh, there are multiple meanings. Um, two segments are orthogonal to each other if they form a right angel. Okay, that's something I understand. Yes, you have that segment here, segment there, right angel. Bam, I understand. Cool. Um, then if you go further on, um, orthogonality is used to refer to the separation of specific feature of a system. Um, and there are a couple of things, Euclidean vector space or orthogonal integral functions. If you go into this multiplexing space, um, the best thing is really to really understand is uh, you have to dig in the Fourier transformation, Laplace transformation, where you move uh, time um, functions into frequency functions and vice versa. And then I think you have the best idea, okay, how it works. Um, I found a nice expression which relates to us very well. In communications, multiple access schemes are orthogonal when an ideal, an ideal receiver can completely reject arbitrary strong unwanted signals from the desired signal using different basis functions. Okay, now we come closer to what that means. Okay, so we have got a multiplexing technology, means I put a signal, a data, and put it in other streams or other basic function and transmit it over. And this picture is the one I found which halfway could explain how this very important technology works. So if I've got a symbol zero, a symbol one. This zero will be divided into some amplitudes over different frequencies. And these different frequencies are small frequency bands, 20 megahertz, for example, also called subcarrier. So this zero is, is being transmitted over subcarrier minus four, minus three, and so on to four. The symbol one is transferred over subcarrier four to three in the same row, different amplitudes with different quad amplitude scheme space, actually. However, the point is that the intelligent receiver could see the symbol zero, and even the disturbance noise was so high that I couldn't get a real signal from subcarrier minus three or, or plus one. With the rest of the information I gathered from minus four, two, three, four, I could then generate, okay, that is clearly a zero. Or this is clearly a one. Um, this is one, zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, so on. So that means it is very proved or hardened against interference, interjamming noise. And you can, believe it or not, you can uh, carry a lot of information through one single uh, time period. So OFDM is the latest technology in Wi-Fi in any kind of RF broadcast technology. So therefore, I think it makes sense that we just get a glimpse or an idea how this important uh, technology is working. Okay. So uh, the next one. To understand Wi-Fi and to use as and to find out what's going on here from the security point of view, we need to understand the history. Um, 
I'm rushing a little bit through this because uh, we have time. So we Wi-Fi 802.11, that's a basic one. Everything is, is somehow related to 1.802.11. Has been introduced uh, by the IEEE committee in 1997, and it specifies the physical and the Mac layer of the, you know, seven layer OZ ISO uh, model. So that means how the, the physical layer explains how from the, as I said, physical electronic way um, the signal are sended and received, how they are coded, uh, how they are hardening, how they could travel, what, what does it mean uh, in, in, in order to receive and resend this information. The MAC layer, the second layer above, are collecting all this information puts these one zero one one zeros together in a more readable way. We call it packet or frame. Sorry, no, there's a difference between packet and frames. There was be a CISP a question I think about the difference between packet and frame. I hope you remember this. So I use frame. Maybe it could be packets, but this packet or this frame, sorry, is then on the Mac layer, and those control mechanism specified in the wireless arena. Uh, has been introduced with the 802.11 uh, standards. 11A comes September 99. Um, that was the first standard. It has got five gigahertz bandwidth with a radiation spectrum. Remember, it was a five gigahertz. So with five gigahertz, you could send out uh, with OFDM a maximum data rate, maximum data rate of 40, 54 megabit per second. One thing is here, when you hear uh, data rates, 54, 100 and whatsoever, it's always a maximum. Your wireless LAN at home, never use the full data. It, it will, depending on, the, on, on, on what, what, what you have, um, what driver you have got, it is always changing the data rate. So this is a maximum data rate. But the problem is in 1999, uh, it's have some regulation restriction in some countries, also especially in the EU. So that means it was not widely adopted. Widely adopted more or less was 802.11b, just in the same year, 1999, when the 2.4 gigahertz, which was uh, open uh, frequency space, uh, but 11 megabit and using the DSS and the direct spread spectrum, uh, sequency spread spectrum um, technology. However, it was widely adopted. Um, a lot of uh, vendor put them um, in their, their machines. Their, uh, wireless NAC card was available and also a big boost puts uh, Apple. They, they, they used 11B in their iBook um, and they introduced the iPod. Um, for their wireless uh, network. 11G came in June 2003. Again, 2.4 gigahertz bandwidth. So in the regulated area, that could be works fine. Uh, higher throughput, 45 maximum, and they use already the, of the famous OFDM um, uh, multiplexing technology. And they have two, I think, very important features called transmit control, uh, power control, TPC, and dynamic frequency selection, DFS. And uh, in your driver, when you look in your, um, in your, in your, in your Windows network um, uh, configuration stuff, you can actually, in some drivers, you can actually turn them on and off. So, uh, um, especially if you have 11G driver, which most of them already have got. And that means that the power control is now really, okay, do I have to send maximum power or a little bit slower, especially if you have got um, uh, tablets and, and laptops with limited battery capacity. It was important that how to save power. And if you do not have to send full power because you're just sending three meters to the next access points, um, it would use the power consumption. So that was an, an important stuff. And the other, other side effects as well. And the dynamic frequency selection is also that at that time, uh, wireless LAN was becoming more and more um, popular, lots of people using it, and everyone just using the channel six. Uh, the channel six was so occupied that you have lots of interference, uh, the bandwidth is not working so far. So it will look, oh, is the channel seven or eight? Yes, it's free. Let's move to channel seven or three. So 
that was very important um, functions. Therefore, I, uh, I mentioned it in this presentation. Um, going on in September 2009, uh, a dual band capability was introduced, so um, all devices, equipment uh, running is 802.11M um, could run on the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz band. First time, um, a technology called MIMO OFDM a multiple, uh, in multiple out was introduced, so that means that at the same time, you can transmit different signal. Um, and receiving the different signal, for example, um, and this called a spatial or spatial streams. So often you see in, um, in data sheets about uh, access points um, running 802.11n or higher. Uh, this nomenclature uh, four times four, column four, that means the first number says, okay, how, what's the maximum number of transmitting antennas? What's the maximum number of receiving antenna? And what is the maximum number of spatial streams? Usually you have got the four, 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 but you could also two, 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 or three, three, three. It really depends on the technical implementation of the vendor. Um, AD has been introduced in December 2012. AD was the first introduction of actually wireless gigabit, yes, um, in the Ethernet work. Um, so this means you have got uh, gigabit availability in the operation range uh, between 57 and 60 gigahertz. <laughs> and um, this a little bit, I saw a couple of debates in various blocks and so on, said, so, okay, it's not a, a real Wi-Fi, not a wireless LAN technology, it's WPAN, WIPAN, so wireless personal uh, network. Um, because it has a very short distance, but a high throughput. And there are some TVs actually available uh, where you can transmit high resolution pictures with a reasonable data frame of 60 frames per second. It is where in the gaming space, if you are in this one, is the one where you, you have a, a good feeling there's a good immerse um, visual um, uh, your site or that is a minimum number um, if you don't want to have this uh, this is flickers or the disturbance so i think ad had his um as a reasons you can you can use it especially more or less in the home network i've never seen ad that much in in the enterprise area so um finishing this is uh, december 2013 uh, it's the 11AC, which is the factor standard right now. Um, and this comes with a new concept. Um, they are the IEEE trying to be more flexible to the vendor saying, okay, if you have got new implementation, new functions, yeah, we can put them into so-called waves, wave one, wave two, wave three, for example, wave two has this multi-user MIMO a concept that one user of our access points or, or, or uh, Nick could, could send out multiple spatial streams and they have something like beam forming. So, you know, usually you're sending out your, your radiation over a sphere, but you can also have a better, um, better form of the, of the radiation uh, beam. Uh, you could do it by the antenna, of course, but also with some other tricks also with existing antenna, uh, with the radio, with the power where you put this and so on. So it's, uh, it's quite interesting technology. Uh, again, something we can discuss in much detail with more time. Um, so the latest hot stuff is the AX or also Wi-Fi 6 uh, standards. I learned it was January 2020. I learned that there are some vendors have got this, but I'm not 100% sure. If you have got a um, concise list of vendors who have got access points, wireless NIC cards, and so on available, um, I couldn't find just some spots. But um, anyway, it's a, it's a technology introduced very soon. Um, it is um, backward compatible with the older standards. And what I learned, it's um, mostly used or will be used in IoT applications, the Internet of Things, yeah, smart home device, and so on. Um, I really have 
to look into. So additional standards, you know, Bluetooth, um, just uh, uh, this, this is one in the 2.4 of GigaHertz. It's have a small range we can use. Zigbee, uh, it's a substandard of the Bluetooth one. Uh, I learned that smart home are using Zigbees. Um, I'm not that familiar with that one. If you have more information, actually practical um, experience with this, uh, happy to learn about this. Interesting stuff is A216 WiMAX. This is a wireless access network or metropolitan network. It has a much higher transmitting power, up to 30 watt, and you have distance up to 50 kilometers. Um, I think that's quite an interesting stuff because you're, especially in, in, in cities or in hotspots, um, you can use this and you do not have that many small little access points all over uh, uh, the place uh, connected to the internet. So uh, this is an interesting technology. However, I have not seen that much. Um, again, if you're different, I know, yeah, yes, if you go to New York, if you go to there and there, uh, there are WiMAX 18216 hotspots or networks available. Uh, again, please let me know. Quite interesting. So, another standard I would like to share with you um, that you heard about this is the 802.11w. Uh, there are a whole bunch of R, A, Y, and whatsoever. Uh, it, it would take another uh, lunch and learn week to, to really go into deep them. From the security point of view, I think W is, is one of the important ones. It introduced the concept of so-called protected management frame. So between a station and an access point, uh, we come later on the topology, what does it exactly mean? Uh, they exchange information, and these information are either encrypted and decrypted. Uh, we have got encrypted PMFs, the so-called disassociation and deauthentication frames. Uh, both are termination uh, connection. We have so-called action frames. Uh, for example, if somebody wants to channel the switch, uh, the station might say, oh, I want to change the switch or uh, the, the channel. The access point is the same. So they have, uh, they talk to each other and they know what's going on. And the 11K frames are called. There are a lot of information about uh, the radio uh, parameters, uh, frequencies, and so on, so on. And uh, if they are not encrypted, of course, for an external intruder, a hacker, uh, those are easy uh, stuff uh, you, can, you can simply hack and you can manipulate. There are also non-encrypted PMFs, um, of course, beacon. Your Wi-Fi adapter and the access point are always changing beacon information. Okay, what's going on? What's the status of the SSID and so on? Um, so they are not encrypted. So-called probe requests and probe response, um, they're active probing frames. Um, when we later on saw some attacks um, mechanism, uh, active probing frames are actually listening to hey, access point, give me information, I want to know what's going on here. Um, intelligent wireless intrusion um, or IPS or IDS system will monitor that. Um, we talk later on this. They are so-called association request and response frame. They are information between station and access point about synchronization and data rate, and so-called reassociation request and response. Um, that's about, especially in an enterprise environment, we have lots of access points, and you are moving from one point to another. I mean, it's mobility that we are talking about that you are not losing your connection, but you could automatically authenticate and associate from one access point to another access point. This is a more or less a complex area and uh, 11W um, somehow protects this um, taking over uh, procedure for the station and for the access points. Another uh, non-encrypted PMFs um, we can skip it. Important things are not that broadcast frames are also not encrypted. And the 11W gets rid, get rid of this so-called spoof disconnect denial of service attack. Uh, still, Wi-Fi is prone to uh, denial of service attack. And 11W um, could somehow protect you, protect your network again. Um, because they are made anti-spoofing. Anti 
due to encryption standards, we come later on. Uh, but uh, please pay attention, PMF is not uh, always enabled, depending on the device of the vendor, depending on the driver, it is not even supported. So from my point of view, um, I will look for when I have to do a, a Wi-Fi network, doesn't matter at home or for the enterprise or for clients, um, let's look, uh, let's take care about 11 W support. It's a very important standard, but unfortunately not every time everywhere implemented. <clears throat> okay, that was IEEE. Leaving it away, let's go to the components and topology. Um, we have got so-called wireless network interface card. Um, they are most inbuilt in stations, uh, what we call um, uh, computer, laptop, smartphone. Uh, we have got access points. They are uh, hardware devices for allowing Wi-Fi station or devices to connect to a wired network. And so we have got wireline Wi-Fi controller management and configuration of enterprise uh, Wi-Fi networks. Um, you know, Cisco, they've got a, a Wi-Fi controller. Uh, every half a decent UTM uh, vendor has got some sort of Wi-Fi Aruba, uh, Ubiquiti, um, Aerohive. So they are also built, mostly built in some kind of firewall systems or intrusion detection systems. And they are uh, more or less controlling uh, the entire security of your access point network. Um, Brian, I think I could switch. Um, I've got some, or if, if, if you could, could switch me off because I've got some example here. Um, as you may see, this is a W NIC card for A, B, and M. It's, it's a real thing um, stuff. It costs about six, seven dollars. Um, just a USB dongle. Um, this is a wireless NIC card from Asus. Um, I bought a couple of years ago for my special PC. So you can plug in a PCI card and you plug in on your motherboard. And then you have got antenna here. You can put it outside to increase uh, the radiation uh, sensitive. So these are examples of um, normal uh, WNIC usually in your laptop or in your um, pad or whatsoever. These are somehow inbuilt in the frames. So you won't see any like an antenna stick or whatsoever. It's, it's built up in, in the frames of your laptop or smart card as a smartphone or a laptop table. Um, another thing is you have got this one is, um, okay, I've got this Zophos access point, very classical stuff. You have two antenna, you can mount in. And if you open this, very, very normal uh, motherboard, I would say, nothing special, chipsets, SMB. Um, you see, these are the older one. There's no special protection whatsoever. Uh, it runs ABG, that's it. Uh, this is already obsolete. You can see this in the museum. It's end of life, end of sales. Um, the new versions of this are access points like this. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's Sophos, Aruba, it, they look the same. Uh, they have different uh, sizes. But if you disassemble them, you see here, um, they have internal antennas, and they use this metal shield for both the protection and uh, the, um, the radiation stuff. And here, the odds of the chipsets are also metal protected uh, because of the higher frequency they use. They have got MIMO capabilities, and it looks really different from the PCB we just saw with the first or second generation of access points. And um, those. From the design, you see they are very neutral. You put it on the ceiling, um, put it on the wall. Nobody really can see this. Um, very, very normal. Um, there are other kinds of uh, access points. So this is a 2.4 gig. Uh, no, this is a 2.4 kilogram heavy access points. You can use it for uh, some exercises, but 
these are the outdoor access points. Yes, you um, uh, you have got outdoor when you have got a large plant, a fabric or logistics center, and you need um, Wi-Fi. Um, often we sell, but other companies sell it to this. We call it a blue light organization. Um, nothing to do with the red light district, so it's blue light, uh, like police cars, uh, ambulances, or military. Uh, so put in this one, uh, just set up um, a Wi-Fi network, uh, plug in a satellite dish, and then you have got um, very, very um, direct access from your iPad or whatever laptop you've got, mobile device to a mission center or mission uh, operation center. So these are various, I just want to show you various um, thoughts or, or implementation of access points. And um, two other things I want to mention, um, you often or sometimes see this guy, this little one, it's a pineapple, a nano. I bought it last year, uh, more or less for tax reason, but it's a different story. So this is easy to plug in into your laptop and you can do this kind of um, um, uh, kind of uh, let's say war driving or war biking um, and to find out um, other networks or do this as a pen tester for doing some kind of rogue access um, pen test um, scenarios. Last thing, um, there are a couple of things you have got here. These are so-called uh, repeater. Uh, they just get the uh, the signal and they a weak signal from your main access point and they just uh, amplify the signal. Uh, when you are, for example, in the first door or the second floor, you have got your access point yes. and you would like to have this in the cellar or in the, in the, in the basement. So you just plug it into a normal AC, DAC plug yeah, well, and then it will receive yeah. the weak signal and then it will transmit. So this has nothing to do with, it's not an access point, it has no security Before. features, a little bit about WPS, we came later, but this is a receiver. So those are the summer of the devices uh, which you need to find a wireless LAN or Wi-Fi networks and um, we are now going into the Wi-Fi topologies. Um, we have got different so-called basic service set. We have got an ad hoc network that is just two access, uh, two stations are connected directly. You don't need an access point. Um, you have got the basic service set, um, which simply means I've got one access point. There are a couple of stations uh, connected to this access point and this access point is connected by a wired uh, technology is the smallest Ethernet network. And the extended service set is more than one uh, access point and connect to the Ethernet. Um, this is what you use in your in, in multiple um, areas, in your buildings, in sites, um, in, uh, in conference room, and whatsoever, and hotspots. So, ESS. Is usually used in an enterprise arena. Yeah, but now we have like and please do me a favor. If you have to plan this, if you do this, either do a site survey. In German, it's called Ausleuchtung, outbeaming. I don't know where it comes from, but a site survey is very much essential. Um, you need to consider the construction of the building, the material you have got. Do you have uh, windows with metal shields? Yeah. Um, uh, so there are um, some intelligent uh, programs available where you can download your, your building map, and then you get a rough overview. But at the end of the day, it's better to have really the access points you would like to see, and then you go and move around and you check the signal, the strengths that every um, every edge and every room yeah, uh, gets a maximum power. So please do a site survey. Either you can do it on yourself I'm or sure. if you don't have time, but you have to build up a Wi-Fi, a couple of external uh, consulting companies um, who are specialized in this, uh, just, um, just as a security manager, yeah. uh, think about this and put it in your budget considerations. Um, <laughs> again, WDS, uh, repeater, what I also receive weak signals, amplify and resend. These are the main uh, yeah, areas of topology in the Wi-Fi. So finally, go to Wi-Fi security. Um, 
Okay, wireless security issues, no discussion, very trivial. Uh, we don't have any cable. So we have, everyone has open access to the radio signal. Uh, easy sniffing, only weak signal or some kind of protection or shielding. This radiation um, uh, can, can work to protect them. Um, the first implementation of the Wi-Fi was a very weak security mechanism called WEB. Um, that is really not an authentication. It's simply I got uh, this SSID as a name of the Wi-Fi network, and you can find it everywhere, and it's very easy to detect. So wired equivalent protection, that is the name of this, was introduced in 1997, uh, was a standard in 1999. Um, the intention was good to uh, have the same confidentiality as wired network using an RC4 stream cipher with different keys. Very, very simple encryption scheme. You have this RC4 key stream, and this will be XORed with the plain text. Um, not, not, not really um, sufficient. So um, we have got two authentication modes. They call it open system authentication. It doesn't have any credential to whatsoever. I don't know why they implemented it. I cannot see any uh, uh, reason why they have shared key. It's okay, so WebKey is used, and um, this is a classical challenge response handshake. You will see challenge, a challenge response handshake everywhere in crypto. Yeah, uh, because it's so easy. I just uh, is an is an example. Um, I'm a station. I want to um, want to get into Brian's access point. Say, hey, Brian, I would like to join you. Say, oh, do we have the right WebKey? Um, well, let's prove it. I will send you a message. Um, Wiesbaden is a wonderful town. So I take this message, I encrypt this message, and they come now, Ingo is a fine guy. They say, yes, Ingo is a fine guy. It's not true, but the, it, it matched the same, uh, the same uh, encryption uh, stuff I used to. So uh, that's the right one. Uh, you got access to it. So very easy. You send out a, a text, you just decrypt it, send it back, you compare it, yes or no. There are further applic uh, application of challenge response where you use in a symmetric, this is a symmetric uh, cipher, asymmetric cipher use other kinds of, uh, of stuff you can uh, decrypt and um, somehow ex um, uh, compare. But again, this might be another interesting learn and lunch, uh, lunch and learn session uh, encryption again, or encryption reloaded, we can discuss. Uh, but in this case, we simply want to skip it. Again, web security is very, very weak. Um, to decrypt data, we will later on, and we have time to do a web attack that is also uh, documented in this presentation. For you, please never ever use web. Um, fortunately, in my neighborhood, I, I was a little bit passive sniffing, which is allowed later on. And uh, nobody of my neighbor is using web. Fortunately, they use a, a better authentication encryption scheme. However, in the, in the real world, um, I, I saw, I don't know, last year in a lab somewhere in the university, remember old Compaq, old Compaq, big, huge Compaq. And they have got this old uh, PCM CIA wireless card in a lab, and they use web. And it was a lab, and it was a very old application. Uh, they use so, so you will see those implementation here and there. And when you listen about this, okay, try if you cannot do with a driver, it's still Windows 95 or whatever. Uh, try to zone it, yeah, from the network point of view to protect it this way. Um, otherwise, don't, don't simply don't use that. The predecessor are at much better introduction scheme was the Wi-Fi protected S, uh, access, WPA. In 2003, uh, the, the WPA personnel um, was introduced more or less for smaller home office networks. Uh, there's no authentication server required. You can just use passphrase, eight of 36 characters. Um, these characters are used uh, to get a 25-6 bit sheet. Uh, share key and is applied by PBKDFF. This is a password-based key derivation function too. Um, 
again, you see there's a lot of more crypto involved put in this way, um, uh, using other encryption schemes to protect um, the authentication and the, and the wireless entity as, 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 as a whole together. So 11i overview, there are three components of WPA. One is, was introduced a temporal key integrity protocol, TKIP. It also improved the message integrity check. Um, there's a mechanism called Michael, which is part of TKIP, and they're using the mixture of the keys. Uh, we see later on that uh, the, in the web, you have a static uh, IV, um, a so-called initialization vector, forming the key. And if you do not, in, in general, in crypto, try to avoid any uh, meta, try to avoid anything what doesn't sound like ransom. It's somehow completely ransom, completely out of some pattern or metas or whatever. Um, and the better you have got, which looks like very uh, sort of random number, um, the better the encryption scheme. So that is a general uh, um, part of the general um, work for this one. So um, uh, onto WPI have uh, implemented the uh, AIS encryption mode and the A3 again using uh, the AS256 in this Golajar's counter mode, uh, mode uh, with a stronger uh, message integrity check um, as it's been used before. So um, if often you see this 802.x 2004 mode, uh, which is more or less equal to the WPA enterprise mode, um, it is used to um, try to use it with radio server. Uh, radio server is a, a kind of so that you authenticate yourself. Um, we are using some kind of extensible authentication protocol, EAP, uh, which is usually a so-called a framework. Um, again, 40 different modes are available. Um, uh, again, we can spend a lot of time using it. Um, don't use VPS, but I think this is a much interesting um, table I put together. Um, there are several modes available. Uh, let's put it to one. Don't use MD5. It has no rekeying, no mutual authentication. You don't use the client certification. Tunneling is not available. Yes, it's a standard, but it's not even WPA compatible. Um, EAP TLS. To the most, yes, and usually in an enterprise environment where I already have got, if possible, a PKA with certificate or with plant certificates, use it. Uh, it has the strongest, uh, um, uh, strongest uh, authentication path. So there are fast, uh, and I think the other, the PAP is uh, introduced by, um, by, by Cisco. They are qua um, more or less uh, quasi standards. Um, if you are uh, if you are a Cisco shop and you are already using them, it's absolutely fine. Uh, very strong uh, uh, authentication stuff. So let's go to the attack vector threats and vulnerabilities. Um, we have got traditional radio frequency attacks. Um, classical is the radio jamming. Um, that means deliberate blocking or interference with authorized wireless communication. We have got jamming or interference. Um, let's say um, that's a critical um, statement here. Jamming is highly illegal. Um, <laughs> if you do not have with other things like pen testing and so on, not get your permission um, from upper levels, uh, please don't do this. Um, you are in, in really in, in big trouble if you do this. However, if you have to, there are still jamming shops uh, available. So this one I found is uh, uh, one you can still buy uh, 3G, 4G mobile phone blocking GPS jammer, uh, also together with spy camera. So this is, I think, um, somehow uh, Chinese or Taiwanese uh, one, the English is fine. There's also a German one available with really bad German translation. Um, again, yes, those uh, devices are available. You can buy it uh, for more or less reasonable price, but uh, don't use it unless you have a clear go for um, in, the, in the right side. Okay, um, 
I think yes. Okay. I've got four minutes left. Um, this is now the worst thing. Mobility attacks while driving. Um, yes, Gemma, that's why. <laughs> that's a good point if you, if you can do this put your jam at your home so that nobody doing or in schools yeah i talked to some teachers they asked me oh can we do not jamming this i heard about this i said well mm, i do understand but please collect the smartphones from your uh, from the pupils not 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 don't use jam not a good idea uh, i i had a, a video but it's no time to do this um Attack vectors, in general, you have got the same uh, attack vectors as in a normal wired environment, denial of service, spoofing metadata. Yes, of course, you can spoof MAC address from your wireless network card, ransom malware attacks, uh, APTs, rootkits, and social engineering. Uh, so just to say, okay, I have Wi Fi, and then uh, this doesn't matter to me, it's of course wrong. Uh, so they are still uh, um, part of this wipe. Um, with the Wi Fi specific attacks, I think. Um, I, I distinguish between trivial and non-trivial. Uh, trivial uh, access to open Wi-Fi networks about sending MAC filter or with MAC filters. These are something you can do in your access point. Not that trivial. Very easy to crack. Don't do this. Don't think that, oh, I've got a MAC filter. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm safe here. It's not bad. Yes, you can do this, but this has, uh, if you have air crack or other uh, stuff, so, um, Yes, um, or, or, or put very, very low transmitting power. It's a very good point, thank you. It's an absolutely good idea. Um, but uh, in the non-trivial, how to attack WP123, rogue access points, either twin or crack, or crack um, it's, it's a different one. Um, I would like to go to a web attack scenario. Um, um, I think I could... Um, I could document it in the in the right way so everyone could easily understand what I would have to do when I, what, what I want to say is we have sniffed packet and you do this XOR stuff with the screen. Um, the point is here, if you XOR the secret text, XOR the clear text, you get the same results. And if you do this uh, with this kind of stuff, um, you could easily go, which is known as a known plain text attack. And uh, from the practical example, we have got um, a hacking tool like Kismet, Nucor, or Edward Aircrack, NG. And the, what we want to do is to find the clear text, uh, how we can accomplish this, finding access points or sending targeting access points, or uh, put this one and uh, guessing, mm -hmm. sniffing uh, with the right computer. Uh, here I've got um, an app replay attack. Um, so this is really basic, um, nothing high sophisticated. Uh, everyone here in this room, in this virtual room, can do that easily. So, um, they have therefore, I just simply, sh maybe one of you are so deep in this, you would say, okay, this is cool, and hopefully others say, okay, first time saw this, fine. Um, so, don't, again, don't use web. Um, okay, I'm going to have to cut in. Yes, sorry. <laughs> no problem, it's now one o'clock. I know some people have to get back to work. Uh, yes, sir. What I want to what I want to let everyone know. This is obviously our first uh, virtual event. Uh, it worked very well. There were very few uh, hiccups that I've seen. Uh, what I'd like to do is we're going to ask Ingo to come back, uh, virtually or otherwise, so he can finish up this uh, presentation. Plus, okay. he'd also like to. He also was mentioned that he has a.